Welcome to the Microsoft IT Pro Podcast, a show about Office 365, Azure, and the IT Pro and end user side of life. Each week, we'll discuss a different topic or recent news related to Office 365 and Azure and how it relates to you as an IT Pro. The MS IT Pro Podcast is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. How's it going today, Scott? Oh, having lots of fun. A couple of broken computers, so I have one of the most asinine recording setups known to man. But, you know, we're going to make it work. All right, so do we get a picture of this recording setup to throw up on Facebook or throw in our show notes or something so we can see how... Hmm, I don't know if I can do that because I'm calling you on Skype on my phone and I'm recording on my iPad and I'm running out of cameras. But I'll see what I can make happen. All right, sounds good. So what should we dive into this week? I think we're ready for some news, right? I think so. There's been a bunch of news that's come out over the course of the last month. So yeah, we decided to throw another news episode out there, cover some of what's been talked about, released, announced in the month of May. Yeah, I think it'll be some good stuff. How about Planner for iOS? I I think a lot of people miss that one, but Planner is certainly out there and out and about in mobile form, finally. Yeah, it's about time. You were telling me about this actually last night. We were we were both on the way home from a conference, and you kind of sprung this one on me. I completely missed this. <laughs> you know, it's easy to miss these things when they don't advertise them at all. So does that mean we get to be the official announcement for the Planner app for iOS? No, I, I've already seen it a bunch of other places, but you can think that if you'd like. All right. So how is it? Have you played with it? What do you think? It is not too bad. So not a lot of charts or things like that today. So if you primarily rely on the management side of work management in Planner, probably not going to be great for you. But if you are doing day-to-day tasking and you're actually going in and manipulating both Planner boards and Planner cards within those boards, the functionality is great. So you can dive into your individual plans or your group's plans, as it were, and swipe between existing boards, create new boards, and then manipulate cards within those boards as well. And it is very much an equivalent view of what you get on the website. So very similar to that modal that pops up for a card to do things like your not started in progress completion, supports things like checklists, you can do comments. I don't believe attachments is there. I can't remember off the top of my head or not. You know, for a 1.0, it will get the job done. All right, good to hear. I downloaded it yesterday. I'm going to have to go play around with it a little bit more and check it out myself. Yeah, it is a worthwhile thing if you are invested in that planner ecosystem to go ahead and grab it and have access to some of that stuff on the go. I think it you know, helps sell that story of anytime, anywhere, any device across more of the stack. All right. So another one related to Planner, I think this one was relatively new. I saw it the other day. I can't remember where I saw it when it was announced, but along the same lines talking about Planner, we now have support for Planner in Microsoft Flow as well. Ooh. Yeah. So I was just looking up some of the templates. I know you and I were also talking about, hey, there's no add-in for Planner yet in Outlook. Is there really a good way to convert emails to tasks in Planner if you want to do that or create new tasks in Planner? These flows now, it lets you, say if you want to flag an email in your Exchange Office 365 Outlook, you can now create a planner task from that flagged email. You can do things like create a planner task from an Outlook task. So maybe the two of them don't sync, but now you just create a flow to create that synchronization. So different things like that tied into OneNote, tied into SharePoint, tied into Trello. I don't know, you have a Trello task and you want a planner task? It seems a little redundant for something like that, but it's out there. Go play with it. See what kind of flows you can come up with. Nifty. So if I was on the side where I wanted to learn some more about this stuff, I didn't see anything about that on like office blogs or anything. So do they release that information someplace else? Usually they do. I can't remember where I saw this. So there is a new community blog out there for Flow. If you go look at that blog, we'll put link to it in the show notes. I was just going to look and see if that's where I saw it. Or if I saw it somewhere else. We'll have to hunt that down. I'll have to see where I actually saw this. So we can put it out there, tell you where to go. It does not look like it was on the community blog. That's more interactive. It's actually on, it's powerusers.microsoft.com. And then there's a Microsoft Flow community. So we'll show that out 
throw that out there in the show notes. Again, I have no idea where I actually saw that planner was now supported. Yeah, probably on Twitter, right next to all the team support. Probably. You mean, wait a minute. So Teams is supported in Microsoft Flow now too? It is. Yeah. You, did you miss the Teams connector? I So I think I saw something about it. That one I have not looked at yet. <laughs> well, that one was on the Flow blog, <laughs> not to be confused with the Flow community blog or the Office blog. You know, it's really hard to get all this information out in a consistent manner. Yeah, you would think, hey, maybe let's just come out with one place to announce all this. Nah, we'll just do this. And every once in a while, it's a completed request and user voice that it gets announced on, right? <laughs> Occasionally, yeah. You know, one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of these, so Teams is a good example of it, right? Kind of one of like the very first connectors that you'll see or like one of the templates you'll see is alert the team when specific documents are uploaded. That's native SharePoint functionality, right? Just having a SharePoint alert and being able to send that stuff out. And I wonder how much of this is duplicative or what happens once you know I have a large team. Say I have that team with 600 people on it and they're all registering that flow to get an alert when something's uploaded when they could have just been doing like a document library alert for free. And what are they doing with their pooled stuff and everything that's going on there? So uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how some of this functionality comes together over time. Yeah, I'm looking at that blog post now where they announced it. And some of the things too they have in there are like alert the team with new tweets matching a hashtag in Twitter. And again, that's kind of duplicative of like using connectors in your teams are in your flow because you can already set connectors up with Twitter. So you wouldn't really need flow to do that type of stuff. Maybe this will help integrate with some other services that don't have those connectors yet. Like you said, it'll be interesting. Oh, very cool. It'll be some fun things to play around with moving forward a little bit here. Yeah, so another fun one that you and I have both played with before it was actually in public preview, it was still in private preview, is they now have a content pack for adoption reports for Office 365 and Power BI. So this is, again, you've seen a lot more data than I have. You have this connected to a lot bigger tenant. But this pulls in all kinds of information, reporting into Power BI. So you can really dig into some of your details, your data around Office 365 adoption within your tenant, more so than you get with the -the out-of-the-box reports in the Office 365 Admin Center. Yeah, it's interesting the way they put that one out there and built it. Mm. You can kind of sort of maybe use it for adoption stuff. I find it much more interesting on the operational side. So it's doing things like rolling 12-month aggregations of usage in a particular workload. So uh, let's look at like OneDrive for Business, right? So maybe I'm doing an initiative to onboard users, or I've just set up profile redirection, or hey, it's a brand new tenant and I want to see what people are doing. You can see things like file storage and share requests all enumerated out and uh, averaged out across your tenant, which is super cool. So you're getting kind of high level product usage from here's a workload. So I have a thousand licensed users and uh, X number of licensed for Exchange, Skype, things like that. And then being able to dive into individual services as well. So you can do OneDrive, SharePoint, Skype for Business, Exchange, and they all have a little bit of a different kind of flavor or informational tool set that they pull up. So if you've been looking at Skype and maybe you're doing a push to say, hey, let's get more people into mobile, you can actually see things in the Skype report about how many users are coming in and uh, accessing the services based on device type. And what are they doing within the services? Are they doing video chats, right? So, hey, that might be important if you're doing something with Teams because, you know, maybe something's going on there. Uh, How many doing IMs? screen shares, all those kinds of things. So certainly a powerful tool. It's in Power BI. So you just go out, instantiate a content pack, point it at your tenant, let it go ahead and aggregate some data. Because Microsoft's doing aggregation data on their end, it's not updated in real time. But you can get down to, I believe, daily refreshes with the latest version that's out right now. 
So certainly one of those things, if somebody hasn't seen it and they haven't been participating in the preview, they should definitely think about going out and at least logging into Power BI because you can do this even in Power BI free. You just won't be able to share it with anybody. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to go hook this up to some of my clients, start showing them some of that data they can pull out of it. So I think they'll be excited as well. Yeah, one of the other things that I would encourage people to take a look at is the schema for that content pack is published as well. So once you have kind of gone ahead and instantiate it and filled it up with some data. That's all well and good. But again, it's a Power BI workload, so you can manipulate it as well. So it's missing some data in the current content pack. It doesn't have workloads, like planners not in there, Teams usage isn't in there, Delve, a a bunch of other things, right? You're you're not going to see metrics for those. But what you can do is you can manipulate the reports and even go ahead and kind of munge in your own data where you need to. So if you're not seeing something in a dashboard or a report and you understand the underlying data set and how that's being put together, you can always go ahead and augment along the way, which is also super cool. Yeah, Definitely. So one thing you mentioned in there, I'm going to go back to it, is you said something about Power BI and not being able to share it. Were there some changes around Power BI and the pricing model recently and how all those different plans work? (laughs) Just a few. Power BI is becoming more and more focused on let's pay for collaboration. So collaboration in Power BI would be sharing a dashboard right, with named individuals. So, hey, I spun up that content pack for Power BI adoption, and maybe I want to share that with my change management organization because they're engaged in change in the org. So let's enable them to do that. So uh, in the past, or really still today, you can do it for at least another week or two, you would be able to just go ahead and share that out with those users. And they'd be able to come in and see it and interact with the data, all those kinds of things. There were some collaborative workloads that were locked down, like a Office 365 group, that unified group. That did require a pro license to be able to go ahead and access any dashboards that were shared into that workspace. So what Microsoft announced a couple weeks ago was basically every collaboration feature or collaborative feature in Power BI is going to require a Power BI pro license or there's a new Power BI premium SKU that's coming into play as well. So let's leave premium out of it for a second. So free is basically losing the ability to share dashboards or really do those collaborative kind of data sets. What it is gaining is feature equivalency with some of the pro features like data refreshes, data storage tiers, things like that. So, you know, they're not taking a bunch of stuff away and and not giving you anything. They're giving you some features you may or may not need in the free SKU. So with a lot of that stuff locked down into Pro, what's going to happen is you might need to look and say, hey, does it make sense to license my whole organization or, you know, larger subsets of my organization for Power BI Pro? Or do I want to take a look at this new premium SKU thing? Premium is a... It is effectively a way to purchase your Power BI compute in a consumption model. So you would say, you know, again, let's take that thousand users. So maybe I only have 10 users that need to do pro licensing, but I do need kind of a bunch of readers for that collaborative data. So what you can do with premium is you can burst into compute that Microsoft's given you. So you buy everything based on a number of like P nodes. So I would have like a P1 or a P2 or a P3. So, you know, X number of nodes allocated to my Power BI compute. And then you would share certain dashboards and reports into those nodes. And then anything that's shared in there is covered by your premium licensing. Interestingly, there's also a new SKU that comes with Power BI Premium in the form of Power BI Report Server, which is coming to uh, on-premises deployments. So you will get usage rights for Power BI Report Server based on your licensing for things like Power BI Premium. As I talk through it, it's all very confusing. There's the unlimited viz guys. So uh, John White's awesome with Power BI. He had a really great blog post that kind of broke down what this means and how it changes and what it might mean to you organizationally, because every organization consumes these things a little bit differently. 
And all this licensing is changing pretty rapidly. So this changes on June 1st. Coming up quick, what else happened with that? Oh, the other thing that happened was because this was such a quick announcement and it was kind of like, whoa, what is going on? Microsoft is giving anyone who had a, an existing Power BI free license. I think it's from like, May 12 or 2016, between if you had a Power BI free, free license basically within the past year, they're going to upgrade you or give you the opportunity to upgrade to a free year of Power BI Pro to kind of make up the shortfall there and give you some time to figure things out while they figure things out with what they're doing with premium. Yeah, it was, like you said, a whole lot of information that hit a bunch of people, caught them off guard. We'll link some of these articles up in the show notes, so you can go take a look at them, take a look at some of the premium stuff. Again, like you said, that's kind of, it's interesting. There's a lot of details around premium about what's coming, what it all entails. So we'll throw a whole bunch of those links around the Power BI changes in the show notes for this episode. Cool. Uh, Let's see, what else do we got in here? What else? Mm. So the Azure AD admin portal. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that was recently announced back about the middle of May that the new Azure AD admin portal is now GA. So that's been one of the features that has taken the longest, I feel like, to move from the old classic Azure portal into the new modern portal. So that's finally made it to GA. It doesn't necessarily mean all the features have made it over, but the GA announcement has been made. Yeah, so it's not actually a a different portal because it's really just integrating from Azure ASM or Classic uh, over to Azure ARM, right? So rather than going to the Classic portal, now we go to the new portal, we've got Blades and, and all that good kind of stuff. It's an interesting release, so having this GA and kind of officially supported is great. You'll find that access to things in the new portal, so just portal.azure.com, it's a little more kind of actionable focused data. So if I'm going to do things like user management, ultimately you'll hop right in on the user management screen and you'll see, uh, you know, here's the number of enterprise applications we've configured, here's the number of sign-ins, all, all those kinds of things that are going on. And then if you don't get enough data out of there, one of the things they have, I think a lot of people forget about too, is there's actually an Azure Active Directory content pack as well, which you can go out and spin up on the side. We should probably talk about that one sometime too. It's nifty. We should just do a whole episode on Azure AD. Yeah, we might need a couple for that one. It's a little bit bigger than 30 minutes here or there. So this is like really a good thing, right? You will still end up managing your environment in two different places for probably another couple months until they get all that equivalent functionality over. But it's on their mind and it's definitely coming. Yeah, it looks like they have a URL too that you can use to go directly there. If you go to aad.portal.azure.com, it'll take you right to that Azure Active Directory Admin Center. Yeah, the thing that's going to happen that might be a little bit weird for some people that you might want to watch out for is in classic mode, you could see all of your directories just on the Azure Active Directory kind of slicer page in the old portal. In the new portal, you actually have to switch between your subscriptions and your underlying directories. So if you go to that URL, say you're like an MSDN subscriber, like I subscribe to MSDN, so I have a default directory, and then I'm a member of a bunch of other ones that I manage. So you might have to hop back and forth, and the process is a little bit different. Yeah, all of us people with multiple tenants and accounts and subscriptions, it gets a little hairy at times. You know, it keeps life interesting. It does, just lots of private sessions and guest sessions and different browsers open and all of that all at the same time. Yeah, that's what profiles in Chrome are for. Yes, that's been a lifesaver. (laughs) So what else do we want to talk about? What other news? There was some e-discovery stuff, right? There was. So some new features around e-discovery. They're kind of calling it some of the advanced e-discovery. One of the big things that I think is huge is they're adding optical character recognition or OCR to the whole e-discovery thing. So as you're putting images in, e-discovery will be able to start extracting that text and you can do e-discovery on text within images in your environment. Very cool. Is that limited to certain SKUs or is that available to just everybody who has access to content searches across Exchange and SharePoint? That one is only in an E5 subscription. So another one of those features that... If you want the advanced e-discovery, you better have 
an E5 plan. Uh, you can better have a deep pocketbook. Go, go, go. Yes, E5, E5. Uh, I don't know. I like E5. There's, we could go into a whole topic on that. We already talked about SKUs and licensing. There's a lot of stuff in E5, but you do pay for it. A little bit here and there. So they had some new other new things in there too, right? So they've officially announced that unified case management is going to be released. So they announced a while ago that they're going to deprecate some of the individual kind of search centers. So in the past, I would go to one place to do my e-discovery for exchange mailboxes, and I would go to another place to do it for SharePoint sites or OneDrive for business sites. And now they've integrated that all together. So uh, now when you go to the security and compliance center, just protection.office.com, you will have an area for uh, creating new content searches. Go ahead, you still do like e-discovery managers and all those kinds of things for creating your searches and pushing them out. But it's one unified search mechanism. And the really cool thing about that is it's also one unified query language now. So there's no differences in kind of KQL support between doing a content search for an exchange mailbox versus something like a OneDrive for business site collection. So it's all kind of there and available and uh, ready to go. And then they also had some decryption stuff as well, right? So RMS decryption is out there. So if you are trying to perform e-discovery, sometimes, you know, if, if you've done a bunch of these in the past, really with Exchange, you'll see a lot of these, uh, hey, uh, unindexed items come back in content searches because it's something that just can't be open. And quite often, encrypted content would be included in that. So now there's some capabilities to go ahead and do things like RMS decryption, which is awesome. Yeah, definitely it's good to see them continue to expand what they offer in the e-discovery, continue to expand that feature set. So another one I ran across the other day that, again, we were talking about the other day, you had and even heard of it, but a while back, I honestly can't even remember when it was, Microsoft bought this company called Mile IQ. Essentially what it is, it's an app for your phone, both on iOS and Android. It has automatic detection, one swipe classification of mileage logging. So if you drive a lot for work, you need to keep track of your mileage. This app, will you can put it on your phone and it'll detect the miles you've driven and automatically record them. And then you can go in and classify them as a drive for work, if it was a customer visit, if it was a personal drive, all of that. So they have two levels of that. They have a a free version and a premium version. Apparently, the premium version of Mile IQ is included now with E3 and E5 plans. So it's not anywhere in Office 365. There's no licensing you can assign to it. It's one of these services that they have a dedicated site on their page. If you go to mileiq.com slash Office 365, and we'll put that in the show notes, you can type in your Office 365 user login, email address, it'll go out, detect if you have an E3 or E5, and then automatically apply a premium license to your account in MileIQ. Yeah, this one, you were, you were telling me about this, and it's so weird, right? It doesn't have a dependency on Office 365 other than the fact that it checks if you have an org account and you're in the right licensing SKU. But none of the data is stored in Office 365. Like it's not writing like your mileage back to a SharePoint list. There's no automated capability for you know, you to report like your mileage to your manager, or your, your HR department, or you, you know, your sales leads or things like that, however you're set up. It's totally a separate offering that's just sitting out there as kind of a freebie. Yeah. <laughs> I can't recall them doing this like too much, right? Where they actually tie something in like this and it's just kind of sitting out there on the side. It's really weird. Yeah, it was. It was kind of strange. But hey, if you drive a lot and you want to track your miles, Go check it out. Yeah, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. All right. Looks like we maybe have time for a couple more. Awesome. You got any others in mind here? There's, I know there's a few more left. So, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the SharePoint stuff that's coming, like particularly like OneDrive for Business and path support and characters and things like that? Yeah, you read my mind. That was one of the other big ones that I really like. I don't know how many times I've run into this where you go out to sync a OneDrive site, set up or set up OneDrive, a team site, and you get that dreaded error message that your URL path length is too long. So they have actually increased that now from 256 Unicode count units up to 400. So that's a fairly significant increase. 
there's still some yeah. limits and restrictions around that based on some of the decoding and all of that. We'll put some links out there to the show notes. But needless to say, you can have a longer path now for URLs in OneDrive, SharePoint team sites. In addition, they also added support, and I can't remember if we mentioned this on another one, but for a pound and a percent sign in your path name. So Yeah, that'll be really good. That's kind of the two last illegal characters, right? So I believe once they release that, they'll be pretty close to other than having, you know, a folder names like a folder named forms or something like that. You really shouldn't have too many restrictions on what you can store in SharePoint document libraries. Yeah. So I like these. They're again, they're moving forward. They're trying to really increase their support for some of these some of these issues that Let's face it, we've had some of these for quite a while now. Yeah, there weren't issues if you just used SharePoint. They were really issues when you came over and migrated from something else, or that's the way you did business, right? So, you know, you generate invoices and every invoice has a number on it. And if it was really important to you that you had the pound sign in your file name, and that's the way you used to store it on your departmental file share, it really screwed you up to have to come to something like SharePoint and change your workflow and just change the way you're doing things. So it releases or kind of uh, reduces the friction for onboarding into some of that stuff, which is awesome. Yeah, it is. All right, one more. Modern classrooms for Office 365 and education? I'm going to let you talk about this one. I continue to be baffled by O365 for education, for education sometimes. So the gist of this one is now Microsoft Teams is a part of Office 365 for education. Up until about the beginning of May or so, Teams was not included in Office 365 for education. So they made it a nice fancy ta- title of Modern Classroom Collaboration. Essentially, hey, you have Teams now. So they've added some other stuff in Teams. Again, there's some special features around there, around some gradings, quizzes, OneNote class notebooks. But now if you are using Office 365 for education, you can start leveraging Teams as a part of that. Very cool. Yeah, and I think that about does it for our 30 minutes today. Well, excellent. We'll have to do this again next week. Next week or next month? You pick. Well, (laughs) so we'll do a news again next month. I think we're going to start trying to do news once a month, but we'll do something else next week. We'll come up with another good topic for you guys. If you have any suggestions, let us know. All right, thanks, Ben. All right, not a problem. Thanks, Scott. We will talk to you later. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.